I guess we'll just kind of get started tonight. Uh, we're finishing up, we're working on chapter 10, uh, dynamic UI. And Ryan was going to kind of continue on with that tonight and kind of get us about two thirds of the way, I think you were going. And then I was going to pick up the last third of it. And so I'm just going to turn it over to Ryan and I'll let you, let you pick up where you left off last time. If I turn off my microphone, I appreciate it, sir. Um, let's see, I'm going to share screens and let's do desktop number two and hit share. Um, so uh, Connor, uh, catching up on, on last week, uh, what you'll find, and, and I'm gonna do this again with these last two sections is um, I'm jumping in and out of the presentation and then showing code examples of rendered shiny apps uh, that are an example of the, the chapter 10. But uh, uh, to Colin's comment, uh, the Colin, the, the handshake that we're looking at is creating UI with code. That's the, that's the halfway point. And so that's where I've taken the point. You'll see here in a moment, I just say uh, stop and handshake with Colin. Um, Colin was, are you still good with taking the rest of the way? Okay, good, good. All right. Um, so I'm going to pick up with where I left off last week. And that was related to, scroll down to the bottom here. Um, I finished our topic on uh, circular references. Now, there was a, an example of this circular reference I did right at the very end of our meeting before passing the screen back over. And when you talk about circular references, it is a stack overflow or it's a, you know, infinite for loop. It's, it's something that you've made a call on and it just runs forever. So I'm going to do example 10.5 again, just to, to pick us up from where we left off uh, last week. And so I'm going to change my screen here. We got to go back to my examples and I'm going to open up files chapter or uh, section 10.5 or 10.6. I just missed that. Uh, it is 10.5. Okay. Cool. 10.5 app R and hit run app. Now, what is specific about this? It the, the discussion that they were having or the author was having with the developer is if you have an infinite loop, there's points where the user may uh, add some code or add some, some selection in your particular UI, make a server uh, call uh, in this, uh, this dynamic UI type chapter, and then automatically just create this infinite loop. It's something to be avoided. It's something to be aware of and, and then try to avoid. The use case of this particular app code snippet in the book is this runs forever. It never stops. Okay. Now, if I close this web page, all right, and I go back to R, and you can see that it's still running in R as well. The only way to get out of this is literally terminate the session, terminate the UI. The reason that this is happening has to do with the numeric input. So we have a fluid page, numeric input of N, and then passing an N with starting at zero. With this numeric, <coughs> excuse me, with this numeric input in, you can see that the uh, update numeric input, that's the function call within the observer event, is inputting uh, input ID n and value is input n plus one. So it just runs forever. It never stops. Um, this is something to watch out for. Um, it's not to say that it won't happen. It's just keeping in mind as you develop your Shiny app that you want to keep this in mind of, of potential infinite stack overflow. If you were to let this run forever, it would eventually crash your server, okay? Um, and I made a, a reference to this in our, our text um, talking about uh, infinite loops are often uh, a security vulnerability. It's a point where people will exploit a server's uh, security flaws and then bring the server down. So just keep that in mind. Uh, the next input is uh, uh, inner related inputs. Now, this one was kind of funny because it was talking about a converter uh, between Fahrenheit and Celsius. And the use of this particular U, uh, uh, Shiny app, uh, you'll notice that if you input certain credentials, it'll kind of like bug out. Um, and so your conversion is what they're actually talking about. So I'm taking us to Mr. Wickham's uh, Shiny IO uh, example. Uh, I'm not gonna create this on our own. I don't know why this English thing keeps popping up all the time. Let's close that out. So if I put in like, I don't know, 60 degrees Celsius, what is the, excuse me, six zero. 
okay? That's 140 degrees Fahrenheit. But as I start to just roll up and down, you're gonna get this uh, kind of in integer to double conversion mechanism happening. And it will start to bug out. If you notice, um, I'm kind of in a halfway point. So the precision of what the UI is asking for versus what the server is creating, what we have here is this constant update. So the server is trying to provide precision, the UI is not accepting it. And so it's constantly just flip-flopping back and forth. So again, another example of, of potential when you're creating this dy dynamic UI concept, something to keep in mind. All right, let's close that out. And I hope I get rid of that. You guys don't see this, but I'm trying to get to my tab and it's covered by the uh, presentation uh, media. So, there we go. go back to R or go back to the presentation. Close this one out. There we go. Okay. Um, Colin, to your respect, and, and I want to make sure that, that I'm satisfying our conversation we had about, you know, completing the exercises. Um, within the presentation, I didn't finish the exercise uh, uh, solutions. Um, Kevin, your statement on the date timestamp, I believe, was one of the um, points we made at the very end of our, our last session. But um, I do have a link to the solutions. Um, if we choose to go that route, all it's going to do is give you the solutions to the exercise. That's not it's cheating, but it's not cheating. It's just giving us an easier path to get around. Um, I'm going to finish out these last two examples. And then, Colin, I'm going to pass this uh, control back over to you, sir. The next statement talks about dynamic visibility. So this is new content. When I was reading this particular uh, particular section, the one thing that I, I was caught on or that I wanted to express to uh, our team and then anybody that's watching this video, um, there's a statement in the text where it says that this is kind of a hackery way of uh, deploying. Uh, the other solution would be uh, if you know some JavaScript and CSS, you can also uh, deploy this dynamic visibility. And so I said, note, I'm not a fan of considering this a hack. I don't like the term hack whenever you're showing a developer how to do an exercise. It's kind of like, this is the easy way of doing it, and then this is the right way of doing it. I would rather show you the more correct method, but that's more JavaScript and more CSS. So I just said, I'm not a fan of the word hack. I said, not a good use of terms. There are two main points to this particular example. And what they were looking for is using a tab set panel with hidden tabs. So it's it's, it's, it's that conditional formatting, but you're kind of um, spoofing the, the user interface to provide different screens dependent on the server code or calculations that you want the user to express. And the example that they had was, I think, normal distribution, uh, with you. And then the last one was uh, uh, exponential distribution. So I'm going to open example 10.6 and show you by dropping down and selecting these different options, we have a different output form. Uh, let's go back to R and I'm going to close that app and let's open up the example 10.6. And let's run this code. Okay. So we can see in the code base what's happening. You're asking for a select input. That's what is giving us our drop down menu. Uh, this is called the controller and it's showing choices, paste zero panel, and then one of three. The one of three options you're giving the user of a tab set. Now, the hackery comment that is being expressed here is this isn't quite the right use of a tab set panel. If you recall in the example, I think Ryan was giving us our presentation at that moment you can provide different tabs uh, for the user to have different controls. In this case, it's one fluid page, one, one example, but you're spoofing the user to witness different controlled outputs. So we have tab panel body, uh, panel one, panel two, and panel three. And then the output of those selections is gonna be the selection panel one content, two content, and three content. When we look at this uh, server function, you can see the call of update tab set panel. We're inputting the 
uh, input ID of switcher and then selected input is the controller itself. So when I express this in the full panel, you can use this code snippet to create different uh, graphical objects. The user doesn't realize that they're using a tab set to achieve this because uh, you're not really calling on the tab, tab set uh, UI. It's just using the inner code chunk to create these different outputs. So if I drop down and I select panel two, you can see panel two content. If I drop down and select panel three, I see panel three content. So if we were to inject some level of graphical object of some correlation or, or, or calculation, it's not technically a tab within the user interface, the fluid page. It's just dropping down and presenting that graphical object in each use. Okay. Um, maybe just a second. That was that out. And presentation. All right. The last uh, two examples are a subset of that tabbed, uh, tab set, one of which is called a conditional UI. Now, I put my own two cents into this presentation as well as copying the text from the book, but it says before covering this topic, be very cautious with any, with any uh, uh, particular scripting language that you use, be very careful with the word conditional. And the reason for this Conditional text often implies that you have to meet this particular condition before an output is, is uh, uh, projected. The word conditional is why I was taking exception to this particular paragraph. Much thought must be placed in the use or deployment of this type of service. Really think about what you're doing here because you're not accessing a normal shiny server. You're kind of doing some hackery inside to achieve this conditional output. Um, so Mr. Wickham had put in the paragraph, imagine that you want an app that allows the user to simulate from a normal, uniform, or exponential distribution. Each distribution has different parameters. The following example provides highlights of this uh, ability. So I'm uh, looking at uh, example 10.7, and if I go back and show you that example, stop that server, go back to files, up one level, 10.7 apps are, and then run the code snippet. What we're going to see here is this distribution. So again, reflect on the previous parent topic of this uh, uh, kind of a hackery way of using a tab set. What we're going to do is have a drop down menu, a selection box, and then change between normal to uniform, and then from uniform to exponential. And the graph or the calculations that produce this graph are going to change. You can also uh, increase or decrease the number of samples and also dependent on what you're selecting, you have these min and max values uh, as a selection as well. Okay, or I guess in normal distribution, you have standard deviation as well. Okay. The important point of this code snippet, going back to R, is highlighting the fact that in this first example, we have the initial tab panel set. So we're creating a variable called parameter tabs and then passing a tab set panel and then giving it different attributes. So the first one is normal, uniform, and ex exponential. And then the calculations inside there are different rates. So as the user uh, selects your drop-down menu, it's going to provide you a different user interface for each of those graphs. Going down to the server call, uh, what we're, or excuse me, UI call. Um, we have that select input, that's the drop down menu, um, numeric input, and then uh, the plotted output. In this case, it's only going to be a histogram. The server call is dependent on what selection. So you're looking at the input distribution, what selection is the user asking for, and then you're providing that, those values back out to them. Make sense, understand? The last example of this particular um, hackery way of doing uh, uh, an application is gonna be the wizard input. And in this case, it's kind of a walkthrough process. So think of it as a very structured workflow. 
I'm going to take you here first. You make your selections. Then I'm going to take you a second point. You make your second selections. Then I'm going to, uh, I'm going to finally uh, generate your output. It's a extremely uh, structured form of walking through the workflow. You're asking for user input, satisfying those user inputs, and then moving to the next task. You can also use this idea to create a wizard or a type of interface that makes it easier to collect a bunch of information by spreading it across multiple pages. Um, we've done this in multiple web pages. Uh, maybe it's a, uh, I don't know, I'm asking for a, a credit limit. So the bank is asking me to walk through entering all my information as I process through each stage. It's going to ask me different questions before finally deciding whether or not I get the credit line or not. Okay, so let's show that example. And this is going to be uh, 10.8 or 10.7. Okay. Go back to files. Back up one. No, it is 10.8. I'm sorry, team. App R and then run this app. So go to the full browser. Now, there's not much going on here from a visual perspective, but in the background, you're actually using that tap set panel to uh, walk the user through each one of these selections. So if I zoom in closer and it says, welcome, click the next radio button. So I select the next radio button, only one page to go, previous or next. So I select next, okay, you're done. Or you can go backwards through the process and make different selections. So that's the whole idea of this um, tab set panel type concept. You're not using tab sets uh, or tab inputs, you're controlling the workflow in a very static way uh, to ensure accuracy of, of user input. Uh, so Back to R and let's look at the code real quick. So I'm creating a tab set panel. Uh, the ID number is wizard or ID variables wizard. Type is hidden. Tab panel is page one, welcome. And then action buttons. I can either go forward or reverse. The tab panel number two says only one page to go. Again, action buttons. Next panel or, sorry, previous panel or next. And then the final one, you're done. Here's the last page or you can re return back to the previous. If we look at the server function call, we see that there were, you're, you're using the update tabs panel function call. Uh, this is called the wizard, which is the relationship to the very top ID. Um, and then select paste zero, page number, and then I as being that uh, unique identifier. We have an output of observed event, input page 12, 21, 20, uh, 23, and 32. I was looking at this code and the first thing that came to mind are these are unique identifiers. So depending on what services you're, you're rendering, uh, oftentimes you will have uh, named calls or specific IDs that you're calling on. So by looking back at the, uh, at the top here, you can see that it's calling page 12, calling page 21, page 23, and then page, 20, uh, page 32. That's how you're allowing the user to go back and forth between these different sections. Okay, this parent topic is all about kind of hacking the system. And I mentioned that I'm not a huge fan of the word hack in this service because it's not a good functional code base to bridge from. Does it work? Yes. A more appropriate way of being able to integrate the same UI would be more JavaScript or more uh, uh, CSS styling. So I just wanted to throw that caveat in there. Um, and then Colin, if you don't mind, I have the exercises at the bottom. Uh, if you would like me to go through these, I can. Otherwise, I'll relay the uh, controls back over to you, sir. Um, I mean, that's up to you. Uh, I mean, if you want to go over them, that's that's good. If, if not, um, um, what does the group want, I guess, is the question. Sure. Anybody want to go over the exercises? Kevin Connor. If we have time, I don't want to make us miss out on the rest of the content. Well, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to deploy this to our uh, uh, main repository or the Mastering Shiny uh, cohort repository. But I added the solutions link. So if we just look at the question, uh, use a hidden tab set to show additional controls only if the user checks an advanced check box. Well, the difference between having a drop down menu and then selecting what tab to go after, 
or using the uh, radio button to control it as well. There's an option in Shiny of a checkbox. Uh, I don't know the exact call, but the, uh, uh, the object that is displayed on the user interface, you would want to link that to your server. If that checkbox is filled, automatically uh, deploy the, the update call uh, to provide that uh, tab to the next user. So we would just create that checkbox, call it advanced. When the user selects it, maybe we pass them over to a different uh, uh, ta uh, tab set update uh, on the server's side. Okay, um, let me just select this solution real quick. These aren't in a well-structured order or there's no direct relation to the figure and the number. Uh, I think it's the, uh, the last digit at the end. But if I find the, there we go. So use hidden tab sets to show controls uh, only if the user checks an advanced checkbox. I guess the, uh, the person that put out these solutions did not finish this particular exercise because uh, there's no solution to this uh, point. I would approach it as add a, instead of having a drop down menu or user input uh, or radio button, I would just have it as a checkbox instead. So replace your UI call, uh, what is displayed as an object and just put it as a checkbox instead. Exercise number two, go back and says create an app that plots ggplot diamonds uh, using the aesthetic caret, but allow the user to choose which geome to use, whether it be a histogram, a frequency poly, or a density plot. Use a hidden tab set to allow the user to select different arguments dependent on the geome, whether it be the histogram and the freak poly, um, have a bin width argument. Uh, geome density has a bin width argument. Again, I would go back to the example of our conditional UI and use that code base to complete this particular call. Instead of the histogram only, I would just replace, let's just do that real quick. I'm not gonna replace the code and try it. I'm just gonna show you what I'm referring to. Files, backup, 10.7, is this the one? Yes. So in here, uh, Connor, what we were uh, discussing was we had a normal distribution, a uniform distribution, and an exponential distribution. In the output side, you'll notice that the output is histogram. So what you would want to do is link the plot output instead of just being histogram, I would also add the um, scatter plot or the uh, freak poly or any other geome that goes along with that uh, call. And then within that particular plotted output, you could add your different features of, of what you want that uh, ggplot call to create. Make sense? It would increase or it would link this back together and tie it to that uh, uh, select input or update input. Right. Does that answer it? Okay, good. And finally is modify the app you created in the previous exercise to allow the user to choose whether each geome is not or is shown or not shown. Example, instead of always using one geome, uh, they can pick between zero, one, two, and three. Make sure that the, uh, you can control the bin width and the histogram and frequency poly independently. Again, this is going to be, instead of statically calling a, a uh, uh, term, what was the word we used? The bin width, um, instead of passing a static value of bin width, it would be a variable instead that would be tied with the user input. So whatever number uh, that they would drop down and select, it would update that input in your server call output. Does that help team? Now I don't have code snippets to show you the solution and I'm sorry, I'm just linking to the, the uh, other link which I don't think is directly tied with uh, Shiny, uh, Mastering Shiny book, but it is the solution UI or solution uh, Um, I think there's a, there's a picture of one of these where I think it's the R studio. Um, it has, uh, the Hadley Wickham R for DS, uh, uh, picture. And then across it, it says solutions on the other end. Um, I didn't see that in the mastering shiny solution, but at any rate, if everyone's okay with that topic, Colin, do you want me to pass it back over to you, sir? Sure. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the 
uh, presentation responsibilities, Ryan. Uh, you bet, lot, sir. Lots of material. And so we really appreciate you um, taking that for two weeks now and then um, appreciate you walking over the exercises as well. <laughs> I, I, I didn't finish the exercises for uh, the uh, dynamic UI one. So, um, but we can, we can sure talk about it. Uh, so to kind of get us started, I'm going to share my screen here. And so the first thing that I want to mention about dynamic UI is it, this, this section of the chapter really kind of assumes that you understand how to use functional programming. And if, if you don't have a really strong, can everybody see my slides? Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, it, it really requires you to kind of have a really good grasp of how to apply functional programming, especially with map functions. And so I highly encourage you, if you don't know too much about it, I have a couple of linked um, sources, you know, they were linked in the book that you can kind of look at and kind of review to kind of understand functional programming. Uh, for me, how I apply functional programming is I use per, I know you can use the apply family of functions if you're more of a base kind of uh, R person. So, but the examples you really use per, and so we're going to kind of talk about those as well. Some of this conversation is probably going to be me digging in to the specific examples because that's how I learned how to do it. Uh, the best way that I can kind of express what I was doing for the past couple of days is, does anybody remember that picture of like Doc Brown from um, Back to the Future where he's got the goggles on and he's got the the like jumper cables and I just felt like that. I was just like, okay, well, I'm going to deconstruct this thing and see what's going on. Uh, and I'm just going to plug things in and try and make it work. And when I was starting to realize it, when I was starting to kind of do that, you would see the examples and they're really, really succinct. But if you expand it out, it's a lot of concepts put into one. And so some of the examples I'm going to share to you is I, I kind of, I kind of blew it up. I was just like, all right, well, we got to expand this out. And so let's just kind of talk about what we're going to talk about with creating UI with code. Really the big picture of this that the book was trying to get about, get across was that we're trying to create and modify the user interface while the app is running. And so the book also talks about when we might want to apply this. And it's usually in situations where we want to create different types or number of outputs, depending on other inputs. Now there's two examples in the book that really kind of highlight this one where the user gives us input where they specifically tell us how many or what type of input they want, or the other examples with data, you know, selecting a data set. And then based on, the number of columns that are in that data set depends on how many inputs and what type of inputs we had. And so it really kind of talks about modifying inputs on the fly is the way I kind of view this. Now, the book also cautions you that you want to avoid this. You can do it and it provides good, you know, it provides functionality and there are certain situations where you do need it. But it does caution you to say that if you do this too much, it's going to make your application too laggy. And I didn't really understand that until I started picking it apart, especially with the dynamic filtering example. That's when I started to really realize like, oh my gosh, there's a lot that's going on in the background. And I kind of really understood about, okay, I could see how this could get really laggy if you're applying this, you know, in many different situations in your application. So kind of the two functions that the book really introduces first are this UI output and this render UI. One is a UI function and one is a server function. The first one is the UI output. This just inserts a placeholder in the UI. And so basically it's just like a hole that says, okay, we're gonna fill this in later. Then there's the render UI and the render UI is actually doing the work and that's gonna be in the server portion of the application. And this fills that placeholder with that dynamically generated UI. Okay. So those are the two first things that you need to kind of understand um, how to, you know, how to do dynamic UI by creating UI with code. So to talk a little bit more about this, um, the first kind of example that was out there was dynamically creating an input or dynamically create an input control. And what this was focused on was trying to use a conditional statement 
to modify the, the UI based on the type of input that the user wanted to use. And so to kind of quick talk about this, and I have an example to kind of, I have the example in an application, but to kind of talk about it in the UI, you, it's pretty easy. You just have the UI output. You give it the, the name numeric. This is basically just that placeholder for um, whatever gets spit out by the server function. Now, where the real magic is happening is within the server code. And so we'll talk about isolate here in a second. But basically what happens is, is, is that the user provides an input called input type, which is just a selection. And they either provide a slider or something else. And this conditional statement, it takes the user's input, evaluates that input based on if it's a slider. If it's a slider, it's going to change the UI into a slider input. And then if it's not, then it's going to change it to a numeric input. Okay. So let's observe this in action here. Uh, I thought this example was pretty accessible, but just so that we can kind of look at it. Um, and then I'll jump back to isolate here in a second. So let's just look at it run. So here's our example. You can change the label. Label. Oops, if I can spell. And basically what's going to happen here is the user can select whether they want a slider input or if they want a numeric input. Now, the book also talked about this use of isolate. The use of isolate constrains the reactive element so that when the user changes the when the user changes the type of scale, the input stays the same. And so if we go back to our running example here, if I set this this numeric value to five and I change it to oh maybe not. Uh, maybe it's slider it should be five. And maybe I misunderstood this example here. But I thought that this mm, dynamic input value. Hmm. Maybe I misunderstood this example. Uh, because my in my my mind was or my mind was thinking that if the user changed the type of input that they wanted, this would have remained the same. Hmm. I well, so if that would work. Colin, if you put a, uh, uh, if you change your input label, so currently every time the if else statement renders, it starts with value zero. If you were to put, instead of value zero, put it as the, not the label, but um, uh, what do we want it to be dynamic? Maybe it's input dynamic. Um, if you were to call on that and the user selected, wouldn't it render it the second time with the same value that we selected from the previous. I, I, I bet the input dynamic is the, is the point. Well, I mean here, cause you have your, yeah. you have your new, uh, so input dynamic. Or maybe value equals value. That's what I was trying. Okay, so this is, this is the issue that I had when I tried this. So I did value equals value and I did this. And when I ran it, I'll stop it. And then if I run it, I got this initial error, but um, I didn't know if this was just an error with the application and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't working as is. But then once you put your label, numeric label, this was the issue that I remember now. Once you change it to numeric and then change this, that isolate should now isolate that reactive or it should like constrain that reactive. So that was the issue that I had because I remember playing around with it before and I was trying to put the value in. But on application startup, it had that error initially. And I don't know if that was just an error with the application in the book as it was. But or it's not able to deal with the null value that is non-existent. Maybe that's the, the where that error is being generated from. I get the initially same error zero too. Or null. I get, I get the same error too. Yeah. And so kind of going back, big picture of this. So big picture of it really is, is that you know, with that isolate, uh, isolating that input dynamic, it's basically just constraining that if the user selects, if they, you know, they give an input for that specific numeric value, if they change it to slider or numeric, that isolate constrains that reactive. The other thing about that as well is, is that it 
uh, it saves on computation is what the book was talking as well. So like to show this example again, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run this in showcase mode because I think this is gonna make it a little bit, um, so I'm gonna take this and I'm gonna run this in showcase mode with isolate. So stop, run app. So here's our application that's running. We can change our label, numeric. Here's our slider, numeric. Give it some value here. And we're looking at multiple controls, input controls. And so if the user changes this, uh, hmm, maybe this was a bad example. But what I was trying to get at was is that 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 this value isolates this input dynamic. So if the user changes the type, it's gonna constrain that input. And so um, again, it gives you that kind of functionality to switch back and forth without having to um, re-modify that input. Um, but you can kind of see how the conditional works with the showcase mode. Obviously, if they change to slider, it's gonna, it's gonna change that value again, looking for slider. If it's slider, changes to slider input. If they change it to numeric, it's going to go through that conditional and see that it's no longer slider as the input. And so then it's going to just default to numeric input. So as a team, is this the first time we're looking at conditional uh, or, or uh, logic if else statements within a server call? Have we had any previous examples of that same concept? I don't I, recall. I'll open it. Let's go to the group. We'll say validates kind of. Well, we, we've used switch. Well, no, switch is, well, switch is a conditional though, isn't it? Switch is kind of, it's a, it's a more complicated conditional. You're right, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've had switch, but I don't think we've had like a direct application of if else statements in it. But again, you know, the book, at this part of the book, it, it assumes a lot of stuff and it's, it, you know, it assumes that you understand conditionals. It, it assumes that you understand, um, you know, uh, functional programming and stuff like that. And so, you know, part of this is that there's a lot of stuff that you had to kind of bring in to really understand like what's going on here. And even, even part of this is I really didn't understand this isolate. And the other thing that threw me off was this dynamic, why the slider input was named dynamic. And my assumption is, and my mental model of it is, is that it will run. And then once it's selected slider or new, numeric, that's the input that you have. And then because this is the isolate section here with the input dynamic, that's gonna you know constrain it because now we have that input that's actually run. It's that placeholder, right? So placeholder is dynamic. Mm -hmm. Correct. Okay. And so it kind of that's the way I understand it. And you know, it makes sense, right? Because in this in this specific app, we're only gonna get either or, right? We're either gonna get the slider input or we're gonna get the numeric input. So both of these could contain the same like input label and so that first kind of threw me off until i started playing around with it then it made a little bit more sense to me but what other questions do people have about this specific example this one was pretty this one was pretty straightforward um it's just it's just a conditional and then so moving on from there we're going to jump into uh looking at functional programming. And so really, really kind of how, how this kind of example is framed, it, it, it asks the questions of what if, what do we do in cases where we don't know how many inputs a user actually needs? You know, how do we, you know, because we can't just brute force put in like, oh, they're going to get 10 inputs and regardless of it, they're just going to have 10 inputs. And so really what this multiple controls was trying to do is to give your application the flexibility to give functionality to your user to set how many ever how many how many inputs they actually need for what they want to do. Now this part in this example relies heavily on functional programming. And functional programming in this context really allows us to write very succinct code but also this code is very powerful because it can do a lot of heavy lifting. Now, I think the book kind of glosses over this concept of imperative versus functional programming. It kind of, it kind of says, hey, just go check it out. 
you know, go read this section. And it just, it links you off to the advanced R um, book about it. So I felt there was a little bit of conversation that needed to be had about it. And I really think that the section in iteration of R for DS gives a, gives a more of a foundational understanding of this. It goes a little bit deeper in the advanced, but the R for DS one does a really good job of just saying, hey, general terms, this is what this is. And so when we talk about imperative programming, and I'm just going to abbreviate, abbreviate it as IP, is we're talking about for loops and while loops. And these are those explicit methods to apply iteration to solve a problem. They're very explicit. You write out the specific steps that you want to take. One disadvantage for imperative programming is, is that it is it requires a lot of bookkeeping. You have to have a lot of code to tell it exactly what it wants to do. On the other side of this is another paradigm, which is functional programming. And functional programming uses functions to abstract out common patterns, being duplication, which is then used to iterate across different but similar objects. Okay. So really, when we're talking about functional programming, and in my mind, this is my mental model of it, you create some type of function or you use some type of function, and then you apply that function over similar objects over and over and over again, is basically the way I understand it. And that's what we're going to do in this example, but we're going to apply it in a shiny context where we're applying these UI functions and we're iterating it over to create multiple UI outputs is basically what we're trying to do. And so it's really, you know, I boil it down again, it's applying functions over and over to solve a problem. That, that's the way I understand it. There's, there's more to it, but at a base foundation for the way I understand it, it's just you're applying functions over and over again to solve a problem. And so you can read more about functional programming. I've linked them here. One goes to the advanced R chapter. One goes to the R for DS chapter if you're interested in learning more. I highly suggest learning how to use functional programming because even outside of the context of Shiny, you're going to use it a lot. Uh, I use it pretty much every day. And I think it's a very, um, it's a very powerful concept and a very powerful like programming paradigm to kind of wrap your mind around. Uh, and then the other important thing about, uh, you know, understanding functional programming and my, more kind of geared towards our developers is we're applying these methods to help us meet the dry principle, right? Don't repeat yourself. And so if you're seeing a lot of, if you're seeing a lot of repetition in your code, mainly you hear the, you hear, you hear it a lot. If you copy and paste more than three times, you probably should write a function and then apply that a function over and over again. So the reason for functional programming is to make sure that we're meeting up to that dry principle. Don't repeat yourself. And there's a lot of reasons why we don't repeat ourselves. And you can kind of dig a little bit more into that to understand that. But, you know, that's where functional programming is, is important. Now, again, the book assumes that you bring this in, you bring this knowledge in. And so if you look at these examples on face, you're just like, whoa, this is a lot going on here. So let's talk about the application of this. And so... Really, let's talk about the application of this in, in the example for the book for the multiple um, for the multiple controls. And so, what we're going to do is we're going to give the user the ability to specify how many colors they want for this application. And so, they're going to be able to select how many inputs they want, and then they're going to be able to input specific color values to which will get plotted to the screen. Now, I kind of broke this out really, really quick. Here's, a, it's, here's the UI side of the application. Uh, we're pretty familiar with these. We just have one numeric input, and then we have that UI output, which is the output that's waiting for the server to create the UI elements. And then we have the plot output, which will actually plot out what the user wants, the specific colors that they want. So Instead of me, uh, well, here's the server function. Um, it looks pretty succinct. When you first look at it, you're like, oh, this seems like a pretty pretty friendly server. You know, I can, I can figure this out. Uh, but then when you start digging into it, you're like, there's actually a really a lot going on in here. And so what I'm going to do here is we're going to poke around in this, but I'm going to specifically default back to using some of our debugging techniques to really kind of figure out what's going on in this application. And so I'm going to jump over to our next example here, which is multiple controls. 
So uh, I don't want the dynamic, I want multiple controls. Okay. So here, there's going to seem like a lot here, but I kind of want to talk through this and what I kind of did. So this first one, this is just our UI function, our, our UI section of the code. We don't really need to know too much about this because we already went over it. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to go through and I wanted to expand this example to make a little bit more sense of what's going on. So I'm going to kind of put these together so you can kind of see this. And this is a moment where I wish we had multiple screens because I think multiple screens would definitely benefit us for this. Okay, so here's the server code. So what I basically did here was when you think of using a map function, you basically have, and if you're just using a map function, not going into like map to or p map or any of that, map functions take in an object that's going to be iterated over. And then the second section of it is the function to which you want to apply to those elements. And so knowing that, what we can do is we can take the functions that are being applied right here and then take them out and then define them ourselves and start plugging in some stuff that's going to allow us to do some print debugging. And so that's what I did here is I took out this text input, or excuse me, I took out yep text input, and I just created and defined my own function. It's the same thing right here, but what I'm doing is I'm just giving some messages to the console so I can see what names is. I can print out the HTML that's going to be pumped out because of the UI, because we're iterating over the UI. And then I'm going to print out the HTML and then I'm going to return it. So I'm just going to run this application here real quick and I'm just going to show you what gets outputted to the console. Um, I also do this again for some other functions later on. Uh, you can see that there's another map function right here. And here's another function with this. And I did the same thing where I just took that function out define my own function and just put some uh, print statements in there to make sure that I'm printing it out. The other thing that you want to be aware of with this too, to get this application to work, remember that functions only return the last thing that is run. And so for to get this application to work while also getting the printouts of what's happening in the background, you have to explicitly have a return statement for that last step. Okay. You don't have to explicitly say return. You could just run the last object, but if you want to explicitly, you can just use return, okay? So let's just run this app application here. Here's our simple application that we have. The user can select how many numbers we want or how many um, inputs they want. So if they are interested in having just two colors, here's our two colors. And now if you were watching over on my console here, because I, I expanded those functions outside of the map functions, now you can see what's getting outputted. And so because I was kind of changing my number of inputs, you can see that it was creating a UI element called column one. And that UI element, because we're iterating over two things in that map function, it's outputting two pieces of HTML code, which then gets put into that UI output portion of our application. Okay. Colin, do you mind if I jump in just briefly? Go um, for it. Uh, Connor and Kevin, are you familiar with what div tags are? Do you, do you understand HTML and div tags? So div tags are like a, uh, it's a break from the CSS. It's a break from the, the, the common call. Like you can say, you know, render the text following your CSS, or here's a div tag that, you know, you add extra material to. It's kind of like its own little separate island of, you know, uh, uh, look and feel. And, and why I'm, I'm taking that uh, exception to your statement of, of printing HTML. So if you notice label class, control label, shiny label, null, four, column two, ID is this number, uh, and then input ID is, is correlated. The key here is that a div tag is kind of like a separate container within your HTML code. Um, I've, I've initially I was against div tags and I, I tried to stay away from them, but now I, I comprehend why they're so unique in the output of your web page. Div tags are very important. Um, it allows you to break away or even add, you know, dynamic controls to your to your web page. 
Sorry, Colin. I just wanted to add that in. No, I think I think that's good. Um, so again, the biggest thing is is that you know again you have to have a good background in functional programming, and um, what you're kind of noticing here is is that it's pulling in this object of column names, and because we're in a shiny app, that's a reactive, so we have to use it as a function. But basically, what it's doing is it's taking this column one object and then it's applying it within this function. And because we have two elements, it's running a text, this text input function twice. If I do this and I change the number of inputs, it's going to run it three times. So column one, column two, column three. In addition to this, if the user puts in like their values like red, green, yellow, now because we have this column names function, these should now be available, red, red, green, yellow, available to us. And that's where that next step comes in, this next function right here. And again, I know it's just a lot of code because I expanded it out. What it's doing here is, is that it is taking all of those user inputs, the red, the green, the yellow. So technically we have three elements. Um, ignore these because that's just, you know, intermittently when I was typing, it was tracking it. But once it got the final ones, now we have three elements and kind of like a three element vector. What it does is it passes it into that map function, red, green, yellow, into this function called extract color function, which I've expanded out. And basically what it's doing is it's pulling from the input that color name, red, green, yellow. And this is a new new kind of pipe that I didn't know, know about, but if this is a null value, it's just going to make it just an, an empty string value so that if the user decides to leave one of these empty, it just becomes transparent. Or well, I think as you were typing in green, you didn't finish the, the word, hmm. and that was a bad color for it. It wouldn't, it, bad word, bad string. It wouldn't accept it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 so it exactly. So substituted that empty, empty string instead. Yep, exactly. Yep. Um, so uh, let's see. And then, you know, here's just the bar plot. You know, we already kind of know about the bar plot, but at the end, you know, it's trying to output this object called plot. And then that gets put into our UI for this specific thing right here. So, so uh, go ahead. I'm still, I'm still stuck, stuck on that, on that new sort of pipe thing. I don't know if it's technically a pipe, but is that like coalesce, but for null values instead of NA? <sighs> to be honest, I struggled with this part too, because I was like, I was looking at it and it, it, does somebody else have any viewpoint? Cause I'm, I'm talking out loud. So if anybody else has a viewpoint, please jump in. I was only going to comment that a double bar is usually an or statement. So it's like input, use the color. If it's not, if it's a null value, and then use this instead. Uh, that's probably bad syntax. So I, I just know that double, double bars are, are often uh, attributed to the or statement. Yeah, I, all, I, all, I, all I really understood this as is it's being, it's just kind of like, a, I don't want to call it a conditional, but it's just basically like, it says it's like, if this is null, if this is null, then return this empty string. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, the, that's the way I understood it. I think it's just more of like a validation check. And it's a validation check, not necessarily to give your user like input of what's happening, but to make the application run so it just stays transparent. Right, so this is so if, if that's, I think I agree. And that sounds to me like very similar to the coalesce function, but for nulls instead of, it, of missing. Yeah. I mean, what we could do is, I mean, we could stop the application and look into it a little bit more. I'm sure there's documentation on it. This is the first time I've ever seen it and I struggled with it. And I was like, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> it took me a while to kind of like figure out what was going on with it. And then I was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. Bar bar. Oh, whoops. Help on topic was found in the following packages, default value for null. Uh, so it's an infix function. Uh, yeah. 
Okay. I don't know too much about it. That's that's the best I got for you. <laughs> I, th- I, th- I think your explanation was correct. <laughs> I appreciate that. I think it's correct. <laughs> it, well, I mean, like I said, like if you look at this, like if you compare this, the two things, like if you compare this, and so you can see the power in, and again, if you have to take away all these print, fu- all these print and return functions and stuff like that pretty much all of this code can be written in one or two lines if you apply functional programming. And so regardless of how many inputs you have, and I killed the app, so I got to start it up again, regardless of how many, you know, inputs the user wants, obviously to a limit, I think it's 10 for this application, or maybe not, maybe more, um, you know, it gives you that flexibility because you don't know. You know, your user might want 20, they may want five colors. And so it gives you that flexibility. And how you do that is you have to apply these functional programming paradigms. But at the same time, um, you can't use imperative programming, you have to use functional programming, so that you can write it succinctly. And, and you know, the benefits that come with that. So, so Colin, that I got reactive. Another... Sorry, Sorry, Connor, go ahead, sir. No, you're okay. Um, that call name is reactive, that creates uh, a vector of character string values that, that the map then applies the function to. Is that correct? Yes, that's the way I understood it. So like map character, so this is what they call a, um, uh, what do they call this? They call this a predicate. Mm-hmm. So this is a predicate to the function. So map the map family of functions. I don't know how familiar you are with them. Um, Connor, yeah, I've used it for map. Yeah, so it just it just modifies the output, and so map character. And so my assumption would be that it's just it's creating a character vector of all of these put together. So like if we have like uh, killed the app again, right? Know what, but I, I guess my question was if we could see that reactive it would be a vector of 10 or n values? That's a good question. Uh, well, what we could do is we could see if we can dump a browser in here. And let's see if we can capture it. Uh, I'll have to do, so that's that. So that's five, I'll have to continue. So we have five elements, red, green, Blue. So there's that. Continue. Oh no. Let's do next. 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 Okay. And then so we were looking. Let's see. There's ls. Let's see what's in our environment. So there's columns there. So let's look at structure of columns. Here's your red, green, blue character vector. Right. Nice. Um, yeah, so, so it's not a list. It's an, it's an actual vector. Yeah, and I think that's be I think that's because of of the map character, right? Um, it's that it's that character vector, you know, because the predicate function for that map function is changing it into a character, and then you know, character one through five, red, green, blue, and then NAs. So I may be throwing a curveball in the thought process. I know that we're using red, green, blue, yellow, whatever. Um, what about hex values? Would it require us to change the map character predicate to some other map hex uh, or some other derivative? I, that's strange, a really I rhetorical question. So, uh, I, I can, so go back to your print function, print output function. That color red is not actually color red. It has a hex value in HTML, or if you're talking in RGB. Uh, YMTK, whatever whatever classification you want to uh, pass it in. Um, normally, color codes are always in hex form. I was just curious if the current code base that we're using as an example would allow hex input for colors. That And that's a good question because while you were talking, I was thinking about that. I think it's pulling it from... See, I don't know where it's... I don't know exactly where it's pulling it from. Like, it would have to have some form of data, right? To pull this from, well, I so, think the ex- extract color function, right? The the variable extract color function is what correlates the color red in English or, or human speech, and then passes over. If mm-hmm. you were to print your HTML in relation to that, 
Currently we have print extracted color, return extracted color lines 38 and 39. Mm -hmm. If you were to add that print HTML, return HTML, I wonder if it would give us that value as well. It, you don't, we don't have to mess with it. I know I'm just adding another curveball to the thought, but. I, it, I think my read of it is that our plot is a, is a base R plotting function and R has a couple of colors that it has assigned hex values for like red, green, and yellow, like all the primary ones. So I think bar plot takes that red string natively and turns it into hex on its side. Because we're passing that that into this column argument or the COL argument. So yeah, it's a it's, vector. It's, a, of it's one of the first it's one of the first arguments, I believe. Uh, so it's a vector of colors of the bars right. or components by default gray is used as a vector in a gamma corrected gray palette if if I have some matrix um maybe maybe I, I don't know uh maybe if you you dump a hex code in there because again you know connor's right because it doesn't really have data it's just defaulting to what the bar plot function provides to you so you'd have to dig a little bit more into the bar plot function to see if it would take a hex code um, we're already at 7.05. Um, uh, we can cover the next example. I know we're, I know we've been pretty strict about the hour. It's up, it's up to everybody else. What do you want to do? Do you want to call it the session and then cover this next, the next example next week? Or, um, yeah, I'll just leave it up to the group to make a decision. I don't want to make, uh, and again, I don't want to make anybody stay past. So I'm happy to finish up. I'm good. Yeah. Kevin? I can stay about 15 more minutes. So. Okay. I will try my best. <laughs> <'Cause Well>, this... <laughs> I also don't mind finishing up next week either because I love this stuff. So great. How about we do that? I think that in just all fairness, let's just, let's, let's table it again. So, you know, if Ryan kind of jumps in, the other Ryan jumps in and, and we, we stick to our, stick to our rules of sticking it to an hour. So, um, Next week, we'll finish up this last portion. The next chapter is chapter, I think we'll get done with that one pretty easily, 15, 20 minutes. Next one is bookmarking. Um, if anybody is interested in doing that, you know, just uh, you could reach out in Slack and just let me know. Um, if not, you know, I, I, can take, I can take it on. Um, and then we have tidy evaluation, excuse me, as well. Um, yeah, other than that, have a good rest of your night. I'll hang out a little bit more if people want to kind of dig into this. We won't cover the next example, but if people want to hang out and talk a little bit more, we can. But if not, see you guys later. <laughs> All right. See you. Bye, everyone. See ya. Yeah, Colin, I think it, uh, I think it does, our plot does uh, have built-in things here. I put some code, some code in the, in the chat. Oh, okay. Let's see. Okay. I'm yeah, not so a I'm not a big base R plotting person. So I don't I don't either know. Am I, either am I. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So if so you change I, that to green, I bet it does it. Nope. Yeah. If so like, if you do like chartreuse code. or something, it probably wouldn't know that. I, I tried magenta. It has magenta. Um, okay. I mean, you can try something really crazy like burnt umber. Nope, that's not burnt umber. So uh, let me see if I can find a hex code. We can just pump it in there and see if I have a hex code. Mm, we'll do this, I think. The reason I got into hex, by the way, uh, is at, uh, vector graphics. So if you're using Inkscape to develop anything or you're manipulating the vector, you know, adding any JavaScript inside the vector, et cetera, everything is in a hex. You don't want to use human named colors. We really don't know what that is. So you create your style guide and then apply those hex values across all of your various tools. So, well, it, it with Connor's code, it did take a hex code. So, I wonder if we run the application, I would assume, oh, that's the wrong example. Um, yeah, I think I think it was good that we tabled this because there's a lot going on with this last one. Um, oh, I don't wanna move that out.
application multiple controls, run app. Let's plug it in. Yeah, it takes a it takes a hex code. But I mean, that's a good point because when you were asking that question, I really didn't know where the data was coming from. And well, it's, and, and, it, go ahead. I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I, go I was, ahead. I was going to add that when you are a developer or a software engineer or anybody, you always want to come back to these more foundational type processes. So you don't want to get caught in RGB values. You don't want to get caught in YMTK values. If you, if all of your utilities, if it's Microsoft, Linux, you know, Mac, uh, what programs you're using, et cetera, web browsers are agnostic to the operating system in theory. So you boil it down to the protocol, meaning hex, which would be the common language across to everybody. And that's really the beauty of HTML or the beauty of, of JavaScript and vector graphics. It doesn't really matter what browser you're generating it on or what, what operating system you're generating it on. In theory, it should produce it. Um, not all browsers are created equal. So um, Microsoft's Edge and, and Internet Explorer seem to be a little bit different than the rest of the worldwide consortium. But just a, a comment. No, I think that's a great point. I think that's a good point. Um, and I never really thought about that, that not ever, not red is not red in every language. Like, <laughs> which yeah, uh, I think our plot, I think R itself has some built in mappings for character strings to, um, yeah, so maybe any of those would work. Well, that's what I was wondering if it's calling. I wonder if it's in like the function because this is this base. I don't know if this is base. Oh, colors. Or color. What did I just call? I put it in 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 formal English. Put a U in color, and I bet it may come across. Well, I was just wondering what package oh. this was in. It's. It, I thought it was in base. I thought like base would have like colors, but this is from GR Devices. So I don't know if this is all the colors that it will accept. We can well, try. Those, those may be the named I values. Think, yeah, go ahead. I think that GR thing is base. Is that if base? You look at that package. Yeah, it might be base. It might be like just base graphics. Yeah, it says graphics devices and support for base and grid graphics. So maybe if you did. Because R comes with a couple packages built in. Oh, paste. Well, let's that, those, those are still considered base. This will run the app. Ah, sorry, I keep running the wrong app. Um, we'll run this one. Okay, I'll just kill it then. Dynamic filtering, multiple controls. Okay. There we go. Okay. Yeah. It does. So I guess it's probably on the back end of bar plot, it's relying on the base graphics package. And then mm -hmm. that data is in there. That's interesting because like when you asked that question, I was sitting there, I was like, I don't know. Cause that's what threw me off with this. I did at first I was sitting here thinking about what this did, like what you said today, Connor, like I had no idea what this was doing. And at first I thought this is where it was like doing like the filtering, like filtering out for the colors, but it's, that's not the case. Um, it's well, go ahead. This is a Boolean Zor latch is what it's doing. So it, it uh, and I've, I've got that pulled up. You had it open in the earlier video, but um, so if, if value X is a known integer, it'll provide you X. If mm -hmm. X is null, then it'll provide you Y. Uh, if Y is null, it'll provide you X. It's just a, a, a switch back and forth between the, the two points and getting into discrete mathematics or logic that uh, and or or nor, you know, if you get into the truth tables surrounding what those uh, utilities are doing and the comment back to Connor uh, when I said that normally double bars are an or statement. So you have this value or that value. If you are using that in a pipe form, you have X and Y unless X is null, then it's going to give you Y. Um, that's, look up logic, uh, it's Boolean logic, uh, but in discrete mathematics mm -hmm. or, or when, you, when you start to write out discrete mathematics, things get a little funny. Um, but that double bar is, is integral to that subject of mathematical discipline. 
and I don't even know what it's, it's, I think it's linear algebra. I think discrete mathematics is part of a function of linear algebra, but. So talking about that, all this really does is it just, it's like a, it's like an NA handler. Mm -hmm. Like it, yeah. it doesn't, it doesn't really do anything outside of, it just changes the character vector to give us this if we don't have a value. That's all it's doing. Yep. If you look up the dplyr function coalesce, yep. it's very similar to that. Just not, it's a operator instead of a function. Yeah. And like, I'm not, when I first saw it, cause I'm not real familiar outside of just the pipe. <laughs> outside of the pipe, I'm like, everything else I haven't run across and I haven't really known a lot about. So it kind of threw me off at first. Sorry, I got to plug in here. Cool. Does anybody have any other questions? No, I think I'm good. Yeah. Uh, yeah. If you guys have any other questions, um, I mean, like I can hang out for a couple more minutes, but I got to plug in. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's what I, that's pretty much everything right there that I have. The only thing, I did kind of want to get to this one too, because this one was like crazy because there's a lot going on here, but um, we can save it for next week. So Kevin's right. right. This was fun. <laughs> well, that's the, that's, the, that's the other thing too, is, is like, I don't know how familiar you are with map, but map functions are like, they're the bee's knees. Like, yeah, I agree. It, and you can, and you can, and you can, and you can record that and make that a GIF that I call per the bee's knees. But it is just one of those things where it's like, once you learn how to do it, you're like, oh my gosh, like your workflow changes and you, it's just crazy what you can do with it. So if there is like one package outside of like Luberdate that I just am blown away with, it's the per package, just blown away. So anyways, it's cool. Well, I'm going to jump off guys. Have a good rest cool. of your evenings. And then if you have any questions, drop them in the Slack and then we'll see you next week. All right, cool. Well, it's good to see everyone. See you. Yes, it's good to see you too. We'll see ya.